they know where you're where you sleep every night because it's the only time your phone likely doesn't move at all for a period of six, seven, eight hours. When you travel, they know that your phone went halfway across the country. Tech companies have lots of other data. My name is Michael. My name is Pist Consumer. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Joseph Steinberg. I'm based in New York. I work in the cybersecurity field. I do a, a few things. The first thing is that I advise companies at a strategic level related to cybersecurity. The second area that I uh, focus on is expert witnessing. So uh, I am frequently involved as an expert in cases related to data theft or other sorts of cyber crimes, sometimes patents related to cybersecurity, but things related to the whole realm of cyber security, privacy, et cetera. And the third thing is I write. So I write a column. I used to write for Forbes and Inc. Today I write independently. I get several million reads a month covering tech issues that impact human beings. What's your recommendations? What consumers shall be doing to leave less of a footprint online, living a normal life, at the same time protecting themselves from uh, having their identity stolen? There are things you can do. Despite the fact that there are media reports every day of data breaches, and things like that, it's not a lost cause. There are things you can do that dramatically improve your odds of staying cyber secure. These things do not cost a lot of money. In many cases, they don't cost any money. The first thing to do, and this is the most fundamental, the most important, and the most ignored, is simply to really internalize that you are a target. People who believe that they are targets behave differently in many different ways than people who do not. And notice I said believe. I didn't say no, right? Many people could say, yeah, I know I'm a target, but they're not internalizing that. You need to believe it. You need to internalize it. And that changes your behavior and attitude in many ways that you don't even have to think about. And the reason that you're a target, if you don't yet uh, know uh, and don't yet internalize, is simply the following. First of all, you may think you don't have valuable data. But your data has contact information. Your data has login information. Your data may have strategies for sports. Your data may have schoolwork in it. Your data may have corporate information in it, corporate emails that someone can create or charts or know what systems are being used at certain businesses, etc. Everybody who's got data has data that's valuable to a hacker. You may not know how today. And the hacker may not know today, but storage is cheap, which means that hackers want to get, especially government hackers, as much data as they can because they can mine it for information later on. So, for example, and and this may be the extreme example, but it illustrates the point. We can be quite sure that the Chinese government is collecting as much information as it can from public sources about every American because the Chinese government knows that the president of the United States in 2040 in 2050, in 2060, is likely online now sharing all sorts of information on social media. And that information could be extremely valuable 20, 30, 40 years from now. This person's friends, this person's relationships, things that went sour, people who don't like the person or have a grudge against the person, etc. And it's not just the president, it's judges, it's other government officials. Right? There's lots of information about relationships, good and bad, being generated now that could have tremendous value in the future. Nobody knows what it is, right? Nobody knows what, who, what, or, or how it will be used. This is one area to keep in mind. The second thing is you have contact information. And if somebody breaches your data, they can impersonate you to your contacts to try to get them to do things whether it's people at work to send information or whether it's to get them to pay money because they think you're in trouble and you need a wire. There's so many types of things that can go wrong. The main point is you are a target. And if you accept that, you'll behave differently. A target, someone who thinks they're being targeted, is not going to believe every email that comes in from their bank that they need to do something. They don't need to be trained on that. They suspect it inherently. Of course, we'll train. Of course, we'll advise. But there's that suspicious Uh, attitude towards uh, these things that's underlying. And that makes a big difference. One other area that I should mention up front uh, among consumers is it is almost always the case that people don't back up enough. If you're not sure if you're backing up often enough, you're not. If something went wrong and your computer right now 
uh, fell off the George Washington Bridge, dropped hundreds of feet, hit the water and was pulverized, you wouldn't freak out. You're okay because you have a backup. So if your last backup was a month ago and you're going to freak out that you lost a month's worth of work, you're not backing up often enough. Many people have automatic backups on their phones. They may back up certain things to their, you know, Google Drive or what have you. They may use certain backup, you know, automated processes, but they don't back up everything and they don't do it often enough. So think about what would happen if your laptop suddenly got destroyed and where you would stand and then consider your backup, uh, you know, methodology. And on the notion of backups, make sure you actually test that they work. There have been numerous cases of people who backed up data, had a problem, and then realized that none of their backups that they ever made actually were, were successful. It's safe to cloud your backup secure because you are entrusting your data, all of your data, to the third party. Yes and no. So, uh, you know, let's change the word cloud because the word cloud is misleading. It sounds like some magical thing in the, in the sky. When, as you alluded to, cloud just means somebody else's computer, right? When you're backing up to the cloud, you're backing up to somebody else's computer and their storage thing. So the reality is that, you know, the odds that, let's take a Google, uh, you know, if you're backing up to a Google Drive, the odds that they're going to suffer a massive security breach is probably smaller than you as an individual, right? They have armies of security people. Yes, they're a bigger target, but they have a, an army of cybersecurity professionals. They're taking many, many precautions. So in general, backing up to well-known cloud uh, provider, uh, you know, backup repositories has an advantage. If you encrypt your backups beyond whatever encryption the provider is providing, so then the provider themselves wouldn't even be able to uh, decrypt the material. And if there were a breach there, it would not be uh, easily leaked, uh, at least in the short term. There is the concern that all of today's encryption will be rendered obsolete in the not so distant future. We're talking about years, probably not decades. Uh, by the uh, advent of powerful quantum computers. That's a separate issue. For now, at least, in terms of cloud, the major providers, especially when compared to consumers, are probably a good option if you're encrypting. When you do backups, you really should have some that are off-site on media, some that are accessible immediately in case of an emergency. And in no cases should be the backups be connected to the primary source. So one of the problems with automatic backups, right, is if you delete something by accident, the deletion can propagate to the backup. Uh, the uh, other concern, which is a bigger concern, is if the things are still connected, right? You, you've you left your backup drive connected to your computer, or you have something automatically copying updates to a Google Drive. If ransomware affects and infects, the primary data, that ransomware will also propagate potentially to the backups. So besides having these backups that are easily accessible, you also want disconnected backups. Maybe they're on a hard drive or an SSD stored in a safe in your house or what have you. Those are the backups, you know, if something goes really, really wrong and you need to restore, uh, you know, and every connected copy is messed up, or you have to build a new computer or a major ransomware hit or something like that. You, you want some that are on site, immediately accessible, some that are off site. Obviously, if there's a natural disaster and, you know, your main site becomes inaccessible, you want to have the data accessible outside. Uh, that could be the cloud. That could be an off site storage. Uh, you know, you kept a hard drive somewhere else, uh, but you're going to need both if you want to stay safe. And again, remember that connectivity may make things convenient, but it's also convenient for ransomware. Just a thing. So let's say there is a company, a private company used by government to verify digital identity of the person based on the physical data that company checks. So it would lead to one company having a large set of data related to human beings. What do you think? Is this a good idea for the government to go for it? Shall consumers buy into it? What do you think? There's a reality that we do need to be able to authenticate people, including the first time that they communicate with systems. It's a lot easier to 
authenticate a person after they've spoken with you and created all sorts of strong mechanisms of authentication. But that first interaction is very difficult. And so the government has utilized parties to help it address such scenarios. Whether private parties or the government is better at doing that is a matter of debate. Uh, whether private parties or the government should have such data is a matter of debate. But the reality is that regardless of all of that, the authentication companies actually have a lot less data about you than many other technology companies. Uh, one of the things that I often begin talks on privacy by asking, which shocks a lot of people, is how long would it take a major technology company to assemble a list of nearly everyone in America who's having an extramarital affair? And people think, oh, that's crazy. You know, there's no way that any company could do that. I mean, how hard, you know, how would they know where you, you are and who you're with and all that? Um, and then I, in the next few minutes, I totally changed the mindset to the point that you see people panicking when we used to have in-person uh, conferences and you see people going out and making calls. But uh, here's the reality, right? Just think about your phone for a minute. There are multiple companies that may know where your phone is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. First of all, your cell provider, okay? If you're using Android or you're using uh, you know, a, an iPhone, an iOS phone, you've got Apple and Google potentially having that. You have apps on the phone that look at location, some of which require it all the time. People are running things like Facebook at, you know, all the time. People are using Waze when they're driving and it's you know tracking. Like, there are many, many, and that's owned by Google. There are many, many tools that are tracking location. So let's just take any of these apps that's on constantly, okay? Let's just take Android or the cell provider. They know where you're where you sleep every night because it's the only time your phone likely doesn't move at all for a period of six, seven, eight hours. They have access to public records that show who lives at that location. They also see your spouse's phone not moving at times. They may even know that it's your spouse's phone based on the login from that phone. When you travel, they know that your phone went halfway across the country. They see that Mr. Smith's phone and Miss Jones' phone are now located in a hotel at the same time that their spouse's phones have moved across the country. They see patterns of this recurring multiple times. That can start leading, you know, leading to uh, conclusions. And I've only looked at one factor, the location of phones. I haven't looked at anything else yet. And tech companies have lots of other data all your posts on social media, all your searches to Google, emails that you send, when you send emails, where you send emails from, where you send WhatsApp messages from, you know, WhatsApp, Facebook, Meta, whatever the entity you want to, you know, however you want to refer to the entity doesn't know what you type in a message. It certainly knows when you sent it and who you sent it to. Doesn't matter only if they do it. If they were breached and somebody else got the data, or the government for some reason obtained it, or a foreign government obtained it, right? Other parties could potentially do similar types of analysis. So the point is, the data is out there. Information about people's lives that never existed in human history until this point, to this detail, from which things can be extrapolated, now exists. And the question is how it's used, and by whom. But it exists. So I'll begin with saying that, again, the attitude towards cybersecurity is probably the most important element in staying safe. If you really believe that you may be targeted because you are a target, uh, that's going to influence lots of other decisions and will help you. Part of that is actually understanding that it's not a question of if you will be attacked at some point. Statistically speaking, it's essentially guaranteed that there are going to be cyber attacks launched at you and your devices and your data, many of them. Uh, some will be shielded by software and other providers without you knowing. Some you may get alerts about, but you will be attacked. There's no question about it. If you prepare prepared backups and you get hit with ransomware and you have a backup you know, from uh, shortly before the ransomware hit, that's a whole different world than if you have to pay a ransom and they don't give you your data back anyway and, and you, you, know, you don't have your data from the last six months. I mean, we're talking about dramatic, uh, not only lifestyle differences, but differences between companies that could succeed and could literally fail as a result. So understand that this is a area of life and of uh, protecting ourselves that is 
very, very important. And at the same time, none of us learned about it from our parents and grandparents, right? We learned about not running in the street because a car could run over us or a horse could run over us. We learned about not playing with fire because those threats haven't changed much, right? Whether it's a car or a horse, whether it's a match or sticks running together, fire is dangerous, getting run over on the street is dangerous. Very few of our parents taught us how to stay safe on Instagram or TikTok. Okay. In fact, there are no adults alive whose parents taught them, you know, when they were five years old, how to stay safe and why they need to stay safe. Cyber threats change over time, and none of today's threats are going to be things that are passed down for generations. So it's important that people educate themselves on these threats. No, you're not going to be able to defend yourself if the Chinese government targets you. But in most cases, unless, you know, somebody, uh, who's involved in, in you know, some capacity in espionage or what have you is watching the podcast, you're not going to be the primary target. You may be attacked opportunistically because there's mass attacks where they're looking for as much data as possible. But in most cases, uh, you stand a very good chance of protecting yourself against most attacks that will come to you if you follow basic cyber hygiene principles. Joseph, thank you very much for your time. That was Michael Podolsky, this consumer. Thank you very much for your time and your consultation. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope I didn't scare you.